The Youth Ambassadors Program with Canada is a three-week exchange designed for Canadian students to visit the U.S. to promote cross-border friendship and understanding and help the students develop leadership skills. And with us to talk more about the program is Amy Sutherton, who is the project coordinator, and Teresa Bennett, who is the homestay coordinator, who helps find local families to host the students during their two-week stay here in the uh, Plattsburgh area in northern New York. Welcome to you both. We well, appreciate you. you being here. It's the Center pleasure. for the, the Center for the Study of Canada. You're the assistant director there. Uh, organizes this with Canada. Uh, give us a little bit of the history, if you would, and the students, why they participate, what they get out of this. So the Youth Ambassadors Program is an initiative of the U.S. State Department within the Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs. And they have this program across the world, and the Western Hemisphere Initiative is called Youth Ambassadors. And so each em embassy in a variety of countries in North and South America are part of this program. And so we work with the U.S. Embassy in Ottawa, as well as our in-country partner, Fulbright Canada. And so we recruit from across Canada with our two partners there. And uh, we're really excited to work with them. They do a fabulous job. A cultural exchange, if you will, often with countries right nearby. The overall goal of the program is a people-to-people -people diplomacy effort. So the idea is to have citizens and s from one country meet citizens of another country. So um, it's not only neighboring countries that are part of this initiative uh, for the U.S. State Department, but uh, certainly we're we're thrilled that Canada is being funded by the State Department as a Youth Ambassadors Program, and um, Mexico has been involved in the program in the past as well. It depends on the year what countries they're targeting as that does fluctuate. The Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs of the U.S. State Department funds uh, exchange programs for citizens in approximately 160 countries around the world, and this is for youth, educators, athletes, musicians, cultural other cultural performers. It's a it's a fabulous program funded by our U.S. government. Now the exchange with Canada, though, these are primarily teenagers, uh, ages 15 to 18, who come down. We have a, a group of 15 youth this summer participating, and they're age 15 to 18 years old. And then we'll have uh, two adult educators join them. And. The idea is that they come here in the U.S. and obviously they go to Washington, D.C. for a few days. They go to New York City, which must be uh, a highlight of the trip. They go to Hyde Park, I imagine, to see the, the Roosevelt homestead. But when they're here in the North Country, what are some of the things they do and who do, who do they see and where do they visit here in the North Country? Well, we've enjoyed a visit here to Mountain Lake PBS in the past, mm -hmm. certainly, so that's been wonderful. And uh, we've worked with the Development Corporation as well as the Chamber of Commerce. There's a no number of speakers from SUNY Plattsburgh who are engaged as well. And uh, we've also been involved with some of the local service organizations. When they're here visiting, you need families who will care for them, who open their homes to them. And Teresa, that, that's where you try to find volunteers who will, uh, for a couple of weeks, uh, host uh, the students. Right. Uh, Twelve of the days um, of the program, they are here in the city in the city of Plattsburgh. Um, they, during the daytime for all but three of those days, they are at SUNY Plattsburgh in a very intensive program, um, developing their leadership skills and learning about um, American government. And they even do a field trip on one of the Saturdays um, to uh, several of the museums in the Adirondacks. But um, one of the really most important parts, as Amy mentioned, it's a person-to-person -person program, citizen-to-citizen -citizen program, so it's really important for them to get to know Americans. Um, it's during the summertime, so we don't have the opportunity to have them go into a school or any of those things. So one of the very most important parts of the program is that they stay. We could um, feasibly put them in a dorm room or you know put them up at a hotel, but it's really important for them to, to experience life with an American family. And uh, so then though that family is their reference for what an American is like. And it's interesting to me that uh, we think that we know a lot about Canadians because we're so close to them, and they think that they know a lot about us. And it's really a myth buster when they come here uh, because what they see on television certainly and in the movies is not 
America. And we're especially pleased that they're coming to uh, a more rural area like the North Country and not to a city, which is what they basically will see on television and in the movies. And they get to meet real American families and have uh, conversations with them over dinner and um, going to local uh, places to visit getting to know their children, their grandchildren. Um, it just is a really nice experience for all of them. And year after year, do you have many families who volunteer year after year and are, are more than happy? They really, they really get a lot out of it and enjoy having the students here? We do have a core group of people who have done it for several years, um, both this and a program that we had with uh, Franco-African countries. Um, however, we are always looking for other families. Uh, the summer is a little difficult for people because they tend to have a lot of visitors and that's vacation time. So um, it's wonderful when people come forward. It's also nice to have a variety of families. And when we say family, we are not looking necessarily for nuclear family type families. Uh, we have a lot of people who are single people. We have all configurations of family, some with children, some without children. Any person or household um, would be more than welcome to apply to be um, a host. Um, and I always hope that people don't eliminate themselves because they don't view themselves as a traditional family. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had some wonderful experiences with families that are less than, or not less than, other than traditional. Mm -hmm. And um, that's important that, that uh, they see American families the way we see American families, which is a whole variety of families. And what are the responsibilities of, of the host families? Well, I like to tell people this is a, an absolute wonderful way to sort of put your toe in the water with exchange because they are only here for 12 nights. Mm -hmm. So A, there isn't really even time for them to get comfortable enough if they were going to do anything to feel comfortable enough to do anything. <laughs> um, they are, uh, uh, they, it gives you the opportunity to get to know them for a very brief period of time, but it's a, an intense relationship many of our people follow their uh, student um, for years, uh, the, several years afterwards. They, uh, the, and the other advantage with it being Canada is it's close enough that you would reasonably be able to go and visit if those arrangements were to be made. So it really is um, the ideal exchange situation. Then if you like it, you can go on to do a longer hosting. But this is not um, anything that would be onerous for anyone. The other real advantage is, as I said, out of the um, 12 days that they're here, nine of them they are in class all day. So th the basic responsibility is to get them to SUNY Plattsburgh um, for 8.30 in the morning and they get picked up at 4 or 4.30 okay. um, in the afternoon um, each work day. So people who work in Plattsburgh can easily mm -hmm. accommodate that. They drop them off, they pick them up. The um, there is no responsibility on the host's part, part as far as medical, the, they will have medical insurance. Um, I, as home stay coordinator, am in contact with people 24-7. If anybody does have to go to a doctor or go to the emergency room, I would do that with mm -hmm. them. I, and I'm also available for any questions. Sometimes things come up in families and um, we would place them with another family, or we would take them in, my husband and I, or there's, there's a lot of support there. As opposed to someone who's checking in every few weeks, if you have a long exchange, I'm there at when they get dropped off every day, I'm there when they get picked up every day, and the host family has contact with me every day. And so the host family provides breakfast and dinner every day? Yes, they do. We have a few occasions when we get together. We have actually a really nice potluck supper um, to wrap up the program. Mm -hmm. The families, some of the families know each other already and they do things together. Um, but we would, again, um, expect that it would be breakfast and dinner most days. Yeah. And how many families do you need? Well, we try to uh, place the students uh, to, to a family. Mm -hmm. Just because that's more comfortable for everyone involved usually, the students have each other. Mm -hmm. um, but as, especially when there are other teenagers in the house or children, um, frequently somebody would just take one. Mm -hmm. So it would depend on how many people take. Um, in the past, we've had approximately 10 families um, to place but we have a few less students this year, so 
Um, we do allow the host family to um, choose a gender mm -hmm. and um, how many they would like and also whether they would prefer an adult or a student. The students, uh, this is competitive uh, for, the, for these 15 students. Uh, they come from all over Canada and really uh, have to work to, uh, to get into this program. Less than a 10% acceptance Ooh. rate uh, was uh, this year's competition. Over 140 applicants um, applied, so uh, we are very specific with regard to meeting our objective to have the diversity of Canada represented. And the finalists thus far being accepted come from eight different provinces across Canada mm. and one territory. We're very excited about all of the participants. Uh, I believe six of them have either a First Nations or Inuit background, and mm -hmm. then there's a few that are first-generation Canadian. And I imagine these are outstanding students. Many of them are probably already uh, geared, perhaps, to, uh, to wanting to learn leadership skills. They may already see a, a, a future in politics or, or certainly in their community in the future. So you, you probably have a number of students that, that are really already uh, yearning, if you will, to be, to be leaders. We like to say, you might just be hosting the next Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the most exciting parts of the program is that while they're here, they will, um, uh, pol they, they'll come with an idea of a community service project that they will go back and do in their home, mm -hmm. a town, in their school, in their community in some capacity. That may change while they're here, but a lot of the skills that they are taught are directed towards them actually being able to start that project mm -hmm. when they go home. So they come for this experience and, and some of what they learn here or they may get inspired here, that is part of the program is they go back to their home community and, and, and have a, a, some sort of a program that, that assists the community. It's the main requirement of the program is that the participants return to their communities and develop an in-country service project. Could be within their school or elsewhere in their community. Uh, many of the participants are extremely successful mm -hmm. with this. And uh, you know, you mentioned the political leadership aspect, but we also very much encourage non-political mm -hmm. aspect of leadership as well. Just wor working within your community, applying the values of democracy and of community service to really ensure that you understand you're an individual who can make change in your community for the positive. And I remember when they toured our station a couple of years ago, and we chatted with some of them. Many of them had only been here a few days, but already had a very good idea of, of what they would like to do, what, what needs their community had, and what they would like to do when they returned. Absolutely, and we teach them the steps of implementing a, or, or designing and implementing a community service project. So one um, aspect that we work with them at Plattsburgh is the needs assessment mm. and doing the research and compiling ideas on who might be your partners. And I was going to ask you some of the other things they learn. You mentioned a lot of classroom work here at Plattsburgh State. What are some of the other things that, uh, that are covered and that they learn while here in, at SUNY Plattsburgh? It would be those uh, various steps of working through the community service project. How do you design a project? How do you do your research? How do you uh, do your needs assessment? What, uh, what do you need to be thinking about in the future to ensure that your project is sustainable? A lot of people have these wonderful ideas, as youth, thank goodness, they do. Um, but they don't realize that there's other people perhaps already acting upon where their interests are. So we take time here to ensure that the research is done um, or at least being started so that when they go home they have an idea, they know who to reach out to, they can work with allies or like-minded people that could help build their project into something successful. And honestly a lot of times those plans change. Uh, what we've seen in the past is um, people with wonderful ideas here, but the reality is when you go home, the time, the resources that you have, you just 
you know, need to sort of change course. And that's where change. the real skills of leadership come into play, I think, is. And that's the learning experience to go home and be able to adjust to that. Absolutely. Being confident in yourself and knowing that you have a great idea, you have great energy, you know you're, you know, thinking of great things and how can I just continue that momentum? And that's where mentorship really comes into play. So that's why we have those adult educators part of our program and their role is quite a serious role. Certainly uh, within our staff uh, at SUNY Plattsburgh mm -hmm. working on the project, we also serve as mentors, but that's the true role of the adult educator uh, participant from Canada. And as well, Fulbright Canada is part of that mentoring process and of course the U.S. Embassy. Some of the speakers who come in are people who have been successful in um, po politics or business or whatever their field is, and they share with the young people this, the everyone fails uh, at certain things, and how and it isn't that you fail; it's what do you learn from that? Because again, um, it's uh, the leadership comes in when failure is happening. If everything's going smoothly, you don't need to be a, a really effective leader, but it really happens to any of us that it's just success instantaneously. So those are the kind, uh, many of the speakers come in and speak to them uh, w of their own personal experiences, and I think that that's one of the more exciting parts of the program. They are able to ask people who are very successful, but who have had failures in the past, how did you get over that? What did you learn from that? And for the Center for the Study of Canada, it must be wonderful to have so many students year after year that you're, you're strengthening the ties, the bonds between the U.S. and Canada by, by hosting these students and helping to develop them. You know, it's amazing the, the bonds that do continue, as Teresa mentioned, over years. Uh, this, is, this is now our third year. Not only do we have the host relationship with the alumni, but we also have speakers with relations with alumni as well as of course staff and partners but even the alumni themselves now reach out to participants and off new participants that is and offer them mentoring and networking opportunities That's so good. And it's as the quite years a go on i imagine you'll have more and more leaders in their community who uh, were part of this program and that will I'm sure. And have ties right here. Strengthen the ties between yes, the countries. Yeah, and, that, and I think that that's one of the more exciting things. You see, it, say, a 15 or 16 year old come in first time away from home for three weeks at a time. Um, that's one of the wonderful things to go home to a family that you can talk o those things over with if something happens during the day or. You know, it, it's a very warm, we've hosted in the past, my husband and I and our kids say to us, oh, it sounds so nice to say, let's go home as opposed to let's go back to, you know, and the and dorm room and, the dorm a, room and, and uh, have that environment where they yeah. can kick back and, and relax. But also to see the growth that happens. We have some young people who are excellent in academics but maybe shy to begin with mm -hmm. and to see them blossom and then have the opportunity to keep in touch through a couple of years and see all of the things that they've accomplished. Yeah. It's just wonderful. Also important for the host families to know that that, that for a number of these st students, this is their first time away, so uh, um, the, that they be aware of that when it, when it comes to hosting them. Yes, yes. Our uh, host families immediately start considering them their own kids. <laughs> and I, those are the kinds of phone calls I get. You know, so-and-so uh, came home with a headache, um, you know, or interpersonal things. They get very involved right away, which is wonderful. They're very protective of their um, student and um, it becomes a family environment. But it's a, it's a one person advocating for that student here. They belong to a family unit, and I think that that is really very helps the program be very successful. And again, much of the intense training, if you will, or experience for them is here at SUNY Plattsburgh. So the trip to the museums in the Adirondacks, and then to New York City, and then to Washington, is probably is that later in the in the three week trip where they've accomplished a lot of what they had to learn, and and now yes. th that must be a, a, a 
fun part of the trip for them to go see these landmarks. Yeah, we, we start in Ottawa altogether. So everybody um, comes from across Canada into Ottawa and we have a, a pre-departure orientation at the U.S. Embassy there. And the group will be greeted by the U.S. Ambassador to Canada. So that's a very exciting and prestigious opportunity for the participants, of course. And then we come to, to Plattsburgh the next day. Mm -hmm. And um, throughout the, the program at SUNY Plattsburgh, we're working on designing and developing those community service projects, but then we take a break <laughs> and we go explore the Adirondacks yeah. and sort of learn the history of this region mm -hmm. and understand better how leaders here have formed this community. And that's really important uh, to enable the participants to connect with the host families because the host families have their experience here. And in many ways, the hosts are leaders themselves. Here they are offering their homes and their hearts to nourish this relationship between the US and Canada, but from a person-to-person -person offer. And it's by sharing meals and by sharing conversation and sharing space and thoughts. And that you know relationship is just so nurturing as the youth think about how they want to develop their own community service project. It's really exciting. And it, it's exciting to see your community through outside eyes. So we had a young man um, who was fascinated with fallout shelter signs, which there aren't any of in Canada, and uh, went around the community taking pictures of them and found 20 something, Still here. which stimulated yeah. a whole discussion on, for instance, when I was in school and we would go under our desks yeah. to hide from the nuclear holocaust. and just a, a part of history that he hadn't thought about from an American perspective. Mm -hmm. And it was a, just a wonderful, stimulated a wonderful discussion. But we walk around the community and there's many things we do not see because we're used to them. Yeah. And so you see them through a different pair, a set of eyes. And, and I guess they're still out there, probably at schools well, and he found, buildings he where found they've, <laughs> they've never been <laughs> taken down. Every day he'd come and say, see, I found yeah, some isn't more. that interesting? Yes. Yeah. Well, and it's so interesting because we think that Canadians, especially living here, mm -hmm. are so similar mm -hmm. to Americans. And this experience of hosting and being involved with these youth just reminds us that there are these immense differences between our cultures and our communities. And unless you take the time to experience it, you just, you don't realize that. So I think that's just a real value of our program in that our hosts don't take that relationship for granted and they really want to be a part of nourishing it and you know it's it's like your relations with your neighbors if if you don't take time to have those conversations then our relations aren't as wonderful as they could be and for the host families who are probably wondering this is their generosity uh, they provide the meals and 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 getting the students there so they truly are opening their homes to them, there's no stipends or anything like that. They're they're volunteering to to do this. That's right. This is an entirely volunteer. Activity. And for the language, um, the students primarily speak English, even though they come from all provinces across Canada. So there's not really a language issue. You don't need French speaking. Uh, host families, uh, they all speak English. They're most their welcome, of course. Um, our participants, some do have other languages mm -hmm. as a first language or a second language, but because our program is offered in English, mm -hmm. it is required that the right. participants spe speak uh, English. And many of the first generation uh, speak uh, their own native language mm -hmm. as, a, as a primary language at home, um, but they all speak English, um, many of them better than we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there may be the, the cultural exchange that perhaps they share their language with their host families. Uh. But if someone has a particular interest, we do have so many who speak uh, very, uh, French very well, either mm -hmm. as the primary language, and they there are hosts who would like to practice their French. Um, we can place students with them who would help them with that skill as well, or their children. Yeah. We've had um, hosts in the past whose children have been taking French, and they have used that opportunity to have their children speak in French great idea. When they go to New York and Washington, they visit all the, the, the usual landmarks? 
Uh, yes, and we also do some not so usual uh, places to, to visit as well. Um, so um, in New York, we'll uh, spend some time at Federal Hall. We'll also go to the National Museum of the American Indian, the 9-11 Museum, and the Tenement Museum. We'll seek to visit and hopefully meet with the um, U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. at the uh, U.S. Permanent Mission to the United Nations. So that uh, is a meeting we're, we're working to confirm. And of course, and with the 9-11 Museum, now the World Trade Center has opened. Uh, the observatory is open, so uh, fantastic. That is some museum there. Uh, very touching. We've heard, yeah, very yeah. powerful. Yeah. And when you go to Washington, um, as many of the monuments as you can, and, and uh, Congress uh, that you can squeeze in, they do meet with the Can uh, Canadian ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, they they also, I'll let Amy go through much of the other program. There is some woven in, of course we take them to a baseball game, a Nationals game. Oh. You can't go to the United States without <laughs> seeing a baseball game, at least with me. Um, <laughs> thing, the, uh, the former Expos, uh, now the Nationals. Right, right, yeah. but mostly, again, that is very programmatic. We do get them out to see things. There, it's, uh, there is some sightseeing, but the main purpose of the um, trip is also educational. Yeah. So they are working. They have a lot of meetings, but yes. we definitely get uh, some sites in certainly the American Museum of History. Uh, you know, some of the other Smithsonian's, we sort of just let them pick which one's of interest to them. But honestly, it's, it's more meetings and site visits. So uh, it's, it's great fun, uh, but people are very tired at the end of the day. <laughs> and they wrap up their three weeks with a, a very formal presentation to, um, last year it was the head of Fulbright Canada, the chair of his board, and um, to Dr. Kirky, uh, uh, who is the head of the Center for the Study of Canada, um, and how they're going to present when they get back to their community, their community service projects. So they are working um, all along, working on the bus <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and working. <laughs> and part of those meetings is to present at the State Department what their plans are, what have they learned from this program. So uh, they, you know, that meeting takes several hours out of the day and, you know, time flies. So you add two meetings into a day, yeah. one site visit, you know, yeah. a quick lunch. Uh, so like I said, more meetings and site visits, but we work them. One of the really <laughs> nice experiences was that they, w they uh, with uh, UN um, members of the UN or UN staff, they did a project where they did a, uh, a, they were two different countries and they, there was a, some sort of an issue they had to resolve and they went through a, um, a simulation. Oh, sort of like the mock UN exercises. That, in a uh, very it, sort do. of brief period of time, hmm. but they had to, we saw leaders come to the fore that hadn't been leaders in the program up until that time mm -hmm. and that was a very uh, meaningful experience to them to be able to use all of their skills. So. I can imagine. What's the deadline for hearing from them? Uh, how soon do you need to, to hear from the families to have we them We certainly would up? like to have all of the host families in place by the beginning of July. We do a, a quite intensive orientation with them, um, take them through all of the expectations. They can answer any questions. We do need to do background checks, obviously, okay. um, in order to have people stay in, in homes. And we also, um, I actually do a home visit. Um, and uh, to visit with them and see if there's any questions personally. Okay. So it takes a little bit of time. And if we didn't mention, they would actually be hosting the students from July 22nd through August 3rd. Right. So those are the dates uh, that, the, that the students would be staying with them. And uh, July 22nd, it would be picking up in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, August 3rd, they leave quite early in the morning for okay. their trip. So it doesn't encompass those two days. It's just that would be that one overnight. All right. All right, Amy Sutherland and uh, Teresa Bennett, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you.